Well, thank you very much, and thank you, Jim, for the comments. And Dean, I thank you for the comments. And uh, I thank you for the award. I accept the award really on behalf of an uh, incredible uh, staff that I've had uh, over the many years who have worked on this issue, these issues, uh, beginning back really in 1985. So I thank you for that, and I, I will tell them that you know, I accept it on, on their behalf. I also want to congratulate all the all of the winners uh, for the for the writing awards uh, for 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 them. I uh, and Jim, I appreciate your comment too. I forgot about it. We rented the elephant. We were down to five hundred dollars, <laughs> and we needed something dramatic. <laughs> and this girl and we, we did meet me, and I guess she made her bench just died two weeks ago. I was at a funeral, uh, but we rented the elephant as a way to. Dramatically, to my difference, and I've forgotten all, all, all that. Okay. <laughs> I stand before you today with a grave and growing sense of urgency regarding the erosion of religious freedom, both at home and abroad. These are perilous times for people of faith, times that demand thoughtful consideration of the price we are willing to pay to abide by the convictions of our conscience. And yet, too many of us, including serious men and women of faith, risk being lulled into a false sense of comfort and complacency. I'm reminded of an experience several years ago around the time of the 20th anniversary of the Tenement Square crackdown. A story ran on a local radio station here in Washington and features several Ten men survived. It was sort of a where are they now story. One of the featured one individual was a gentleman who at one point was number 17, 17 on the Chinese government's most wanted list of ten men protesters. He eventually sought asylum in the U.S. and now pastors a large Chinese American church near my congressional district in Northern Virginia. His sermons are recorded and put online for converts inside China to download. Pastor Boley described his job as letting the love of Jesus Christ melt the hatred in China. Upon hearing this remarkable story, I've been to China and, and, and talked to some of the tenement people, and uh, uh, we called them up and invited them to come to the office for a meeting. As is often the case when Congress is in session, a series of votes were called right as we began to meet, requiring that I walk over to the Capitol with the meeting and so on this particular day, we happened upon some visiting Chinese tourists at the foot of the Capitol steps. This couple was visiting their son, a seminary student, who was studying in the U.S. While we shared no common language, it was immediately apparent that they recognized, they recognized Pastor, Pastor Bowley. They regularly watched his teaching online. They were overjoyed, you can just tell by the face, overjoyed to meet him. I later asked this Chinese American pastor if he felt it was more difficult to be a Christian in the U.S. or in China. He, asked, he answered unequivocally and counterintuitively that it is more difficult in America. Perhaps not difficult in the ways that we would think, but this pastor's answer certainly was thought provoking. It caused me to question whether the lore toward what my friend Robbie George, who teaches at Princeton, as described as, quote, tame Christianity, was in some way more insidious and threatening than the actual promise of physical persecution. No one in America is being arrested for going to an unregistered church. No one is being beaten or ministering holy communion. And looking beyond my own faith, unlike in China, Buddhists in this country can possess a picture of the Dalai Lama. In Tibet, you can't have a picture of the Dalai, the Dalai Lama. And Muslims here can pray during holy seasons. But Pastor Boley realized that when one's faith comes at a cost, a cost, when it is no longer convenient, and in fact downright dangerous, to abide by the dictates of the conscience, there is sort of a sifting, a sifting that occurs. Perhaps that sifting is coming to our own shores sooner than we would like to admit. But before focusing on the domestic erosion of religious liberty, let's look again overseas. Even a casual observer of world events cannot deny that religious freedom is under attack. The Middle East is aflame with radicalism. Entire swaths of territory are presently controlled 
by murderous men who have committed unspeakable acts in an attempt to cleanse the region of Christians and other religious minorities, the Yazidis and, and others. ISIS is not a shadowy terrorist movement with ill-defined aims. It is a growing and serious force hell-bent on seizing land and cleansing it of any and all who do not abide by their narrow interpretation of Islam. And there are 40 Americans who have gone over and had to come back, and a number who are currently there with ISIS and al-Shabaab up in Somalia, as we now meet. If this does not both awaken, awaken and activate the church, the people of good faith in the West, then I'm hard pressed to envision a scenario that really will. This barbaric assault is all the more tragic given the ancient historical roots of Christianity in that part of the world. With the exception of Israel, the Bible contains more references to the cities, regions, and nations of ancient Iraq than any other country. The patriarch Abraham came from the city in Iraq called Eris Nasaria. Isaac's bride, Rebecca, came from northwest Iraq. Jacob spent 20 years in Iraq, and his sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, were born in northwest Iraq. A remarkable spiritual revival is told in the book of Jonah occurred in Nineveh. And Nineveh is Mosul, and Nineveh is where they just a month ago blew up Jonah's tomb. And the events of the book of Esther, with Esther for such a time like this, Esther was from Iraq. And Daniel, the account of Daniel in the lions, then, and Daniel is buried in Iraq. Daniel spent most of his life in Iraq. And yet, a September 19 opinion piece in the Washington Post captured the situation today in Iraq in stark terms with a headline, quote, Christianity in Iraq is finished. Meanwhile, we see Coptic Christians leaving Egypt in droves, Tibetan Buddhist monks and nuns setting themselves aflame in desperation at the abuses endured by the people. 118 Buddhist monks and nuns have poured kerosene on their bodies and have set themselves aflame because of the crackdown of the Chinese government. We see an insidious anti-Semitism on rise in Europe and France, in Germany, in Scandinavia, and on American college campuses. On American college campuses, anti-Semitism is now spreading. We, we see Ahmadiyya Muslims in Pakistan torched to death by an angry mob on rumors of blasphemy. The steady chipping away of religious freedom around the globe was particularly striking given what former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Mary Ann Glendon, who now teaches at Harvard Law School, recently noted, namely that, quote, religious liberty has been repeatedly affirmed in international rights documents and is enshrined in the constitutions of nearly every country. In fact, Ambassador Glendon went so far as to say that this bedrock first freedom is in danger of becoming a second-class right, one that could be trumped by other rights, claims, and interests, and suggests a quote, mounting evidence that less value is being attached to religion and religious freedom in the places where one might have expected to be more secure, namely, in the minds and hearts of citizens in liberal democracy. I venture that many of you who have dedicated uh, your lives to preserving these conscious rights would share that grim prognosis. While we have long known the threat to religious freedom posed by the world's remaining dictatorships and totalitarian governments from the gulags in North Korea to the solitary prisons of China, from the sham trials of Iran to the hate-filled, hate-filled textbooks of Saudi Arabia, anti-Christian, anti-Semitic, Textbooks, even some in a school out of my congressional district out in the Saudi Academy out in Northern Virginia. Religious believers the world over have historically been able to look to America 